Robert Plank Show episode 110. Take your money back by removing the fear and greed with Joshua Bellinger. Hey everybody and welcome back to the Robert Plank Show where we talk about making money. Today's guest is Joshua Bellinger. He was a once struggling professional wrestler delivering pizzas and is now recognized as one of the leading experts with trading options and alternative investment opportunities to generate passive income. Uh, that's a mouthful, but I'm super glad to have you on the show, Joshua. Yeah, I guess you need to shorten that, but thanks. Thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity to rock the mic for the next 20 minutes. Awesome. So what is it that you do? Yeah, so kind of listening to that and listening to it a few different times, I think the way that I've shortened it down is I help people get over or help investors get over the two biggest obstacles I've seen over the last 12 years. What are those obstacles or hurdles? Fear and greed. So that's what I look to, to help them with. And isn't that like the stereotypes, like the, like the Gordon Gecko you're supposed to be? You're supposed to like play to your strengths and stuff like that. Yeah, right. But uh, you're supposed to. Well, you know, no one's no one's successful at being fearful or also greedy. So you know, it's it's about keeping yourself in check. And you know, when it comes to the marketplace, you can get those, you can get both of those sides of it pretty, pretty good. You know? and that's not a good way to explain it. But fear and greed is really what controls the marketplaces. But you know, you have to. You can't provide proper expectations on being fearful and greedy. So. That's kind of what we, or what I look to kind of sum up for people to be able to help them become successful. So you're saying like that can kind of take over if, if you don't manage it well. Yeah, that happens for most people. I mean, why, why, <laughs> why don't, why do most people lose money? It's because they um, are you either too fearful and also are too greedy, meaning that they don't, uh, if on the greedy side, they're not getting out of positions because they think, man, if I would have just had Amazon and I bought that IPO in 1995, I would have been up 2,000%. No, it doesn't work that way. And the same thing on the fearful side of it, when the financial crisis is going on and the S&P 500 is at 666 and you're like, oh, well, the hell or the, the world's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, you know, it, it doesn't, you could think that way, but at that point, you got to say, oh, maybe I should buy some stuff here. And that's like the weirdest thing because I mean I, I don't I haven't done stock trading in a couple of years, but when I did do it, I I was surprised at just how just a, a number would take over. And then even I went through a stage where I would do like some like paper trading and be like, well, like you know, on certain days, say the price is this, and I kind of played around with that. And the same like psychological stuff, like you're mentioning, like the fear and the greed, it still messed me up, even though it wasn't real money. It was just numbers on a even a piece of paper. But it's it's crazy how much like. You have no idea like how much all that all that dark stuff kind of comes in until you're like playing with your your stock all trading that, stuff. All that dark or dark stuff is uh, all the stuff in your head. So you're looking at stuff and you're thinking you're making your own interpretation. But there's millions of dollars traded every day, back and forth, and and not back and forth of meaning like the one side to another. But there's a buy and sell. And and the the wonderful thing about the marketplace is that there's no other opportunity out there like the financial markets. Meaning that you can't you don't like Apple. So you could take the other side of the trade by selling it. You know, you could you could sell short and say, "Hey, Apple's over overvalued here." You can't do that. Or anything you can't over you can't go to a, a piece of real estate and hey, hey, dude, uh, you just sold your house for how much money? And the new buyer, I'm going to short that house. You can't, <laughs> you can't and you can't go to Vegas with an edge and say, "Hey, I want to take the other side of the trade." They'll take the other side of the trade, but with their edge. But you can't be Vegas, and the only opportunity is in the financial markets with that. And that's kind of the most, and it's it's transparent and it's at your fingertips and it's a wonderful thing. But also kind of scary. So, I mean, I, I kind of want to know about um, about your story and this whole, because you can't just say, well, you used to be a, a wrestler and delivering pizzas and now you're doing this. So like, that's like too good to pass up, right? So I'm kind of curious, like, <laughs> how did you get from there to here? Well, I mean, that was a while ago. I mean, I, I started wrestling when I was 14, 15 years old. And I stopped when I was uh, just about you know, 19 years old. So in that time, I um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And um, I was working at uh, I was working at a pizza place, and I went to school. I went to a junior college for a week. And at the at that time, I worked at this pizza place for a while. I had an opportunity to become a manager. And the guy that I looked up to and I worked for, Rod, he taught me a lot about business, and I kind of sitting in business 101 class I'm like I already know this stuff and this is not my route but before then he had told me and and just on conversation he's like man if I wasn't doing this it'd be cool to be a stockbroker I and mean, that was my my aha moment 
my aha moment is because wow man stockbrokers they probably make a ton of money that, like that sounds like a cool profession <laughs> it sounds like a cool profession so i started i watched the uh, movies like boiler room at that time and i'm like whoa this is this is pretty awesome let me uh let me jump on this horse and uh, a couple doors down from where i worked at the pizza place there was an edward jones office and a guy named russ he ordered pizza pretty often i went in there one day and i said hey 19 years old i get to become a stockbroker and he said uh okay uh, do you have a book of business I'm like uh no <laughs> do you have a series seven no he knew I didn't have the stuff, but he's like, hey, you know. And then he he explained but, but, to me. But then he asked, did you watch Boiler Room? And then he's like, you're hired, right? <laughs> he told me, he said to me, uh, you know, these are the things that you have to get to. And I, I live in Chicago now, but I grew up outside Chicago. I grew up on the Wisconsin-Illinois state line. So that's about a 45-minute car drive and an hour and 20-minute train ride. So he said to me, I used to work on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. That's the uh, – there's two there's a couple different exchanges in Chicago that's one of them that's a futures exchange and that would be your best opportunity you know you will be able to get your foot in the door and kind of see where you want to go and he was right but he said to me I haven't worked there in a while I don't know anybody but that's my advice I'm like okay cool that's all I needed so I went like I said I mean this is 13 14 years ago so I went online we had the interweb we had the interwebs then. They're still starting out. But uh, I went on. I went to CME's website. And I even, like, this is how I didn't know much about it because I didn't realize until I was down there that there's a, there's a Chicago Board of Options Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade. So I'm only looking at the CBO or the CME because that's what he told me. But I called every firm in there second time. Or I, I didn't, I went through the directory like two times, got an opportunity to interview, didn't get the job the first time. They called me back a few months later and they, gave me a job as a runner, which only means I had an, my foot in the door, but I was making little money. Uh, I was probably just as, I think that I, I joke that the janitor was actually more valuable than me uh, because you're kind of like a grunt. You know, you're like, you're, you're, as a runner, you're a grunt and a runner only my job in the, in the, those days there's what's known as the open outcry system. So you see on movies like the Eddie Murphy movie where they're in the, in the pit and they're yelling. It looks like they're yelling, but they're actually really trading. There's an with, art with to like it. With like the yellow coats and stuff? Yeah, yeah. I forget okay. the movie. I think it's Trading Money or something. or Trading Places. Trading Places, yeah. So um, in that movie, that's when things were really buzzing. When I got there, it was buzzing, but not as much as that. Uh, and also that's a movie, but that's a different story. <laughs> right. uh, but a runner actually would go – and have to fight through those crowds to get the tickets from the traders who are in the pit there. And usually some of them are, if they're bigger, they had a clerk, which is, you know, essentially an assistant. Um, you would have to get, I would have to get, fight through there, get in, get all these tickets from who I need to get tickets from. And the tickets are these trading cards because that's how they traded. And they recorded it. Take those in within 15 minutes because it all had happened. Get them time stamped at the clearing firm. So that's why I had to fight it. And they don't just let you in. They don't say, hey, Josh, oh, my God, you're the runner. you got to get to Bill over there. Let me – come on through. No, They're, they push you out of the way. They elbow you, and they know that you're new. You know, they don't make it easy. And you, you get in their way. They yell at you. They miss it. I mean, like, it's a – it was pretty pretty fun experience. Yeah, it was pretty fun. stuff sounds like. Yeah, I mean, it, you have to break in. It, it was – it. I love the opportunity. I mean, I I, I miss it. It was a unique experience. I would never trade it for anything. So so cool. So I mean, that's how you got your foot in the door. And is that? I mean, obviously you don't do that now. So what is it that you do now? Yeah. So I, that's how I got my foot in the door. And then from there, I mean, I I could summarize my whole background. I mean, it could take a while, but I took different opportunities. I leveraged that, and and eventually be, I became a stockbroker. Realized that's not what I wanted to do. And I was fortunate enough to have that experience as a, being on the floor to realize, man, I'm on the. I got my Series Seven now. I thought, I thought I knew everything, and I here I become a stockbroker. I'm making 600 calls a day, man. And all I'm doing is this pitching product, man. This is like a sales job. And when I would ask about, you know, like, hey, you know, this client asked me or this person asked me about the market, what I thought about it, and uh, what my senior broker would he'd say to me. Uh, your opinion doesn't matter. Like, just go sell, go go open accounts. Oh, and I'm like, wow. And I would ask questions of like, hey, you know, what do you think of Martin? He's like, kid, 
just go open accounts. Like that doesn't matter. I'm like, wow, this is not as fun as I thought it was going to be. And, uh, so I, I had different opportunities. I mean, I, I, I have a lot of experience in different aspects of the financial industry, but in 2008, I was working on a trade desk and I really kind of wanted to do something on my own. I was starting to, to manage money on the side. And I also wanted to start a website because how I got gravitated towards specifically options is, is what I, I teach or what I you know, primary focus in on. But to, to be honest with everyone and, and you know to help them understand, options are only a product. Stocks are a product, options are a product, futures are a product. It's just understanding how to use them all all at once or how to use them to be successful because you you know it's like having just one product and saying oh I'll, all I want is this to okay like for instance all I want to do is eat chicken like well okay well what about steak and what about this I mean like you can enjoy all those things but why do you just have to have chicken it gets old fast it gets old fast and it's and not but the best example is the first thing I could come up with anyways they're all products and they just they all work together uh, and on all actuality Stocks are easier. That's why most people gravitate to our, towards it. Uh, but I worked in the on I, I worked in different aspects of the financial industry, and it's just there's a lot of restrictions, um, and there's a lot of things I didn't like. Uh, I didn't like a lot of the the regulations, the restrictions, and all I was supposed to do was to sell products and gather assets. And I thought I could do more for people. I thought I could do more and provide more because that's all I asked. And I, every time I asked to do something more, I was always shut down. Nope can't do that. Nope. Shouldn't do that. Nope. Like, um, don't, don't be creative. You're a machine. Keep making yep. phone calls. Don't, don't be a machine. There's a, there's a stock called um, Rick's Cabaret. It's the ticker symbol, stock symbol is R-I-C-K. It's a strip club. And I thought it'd be cool if I could I could pitch those and open clients. I'm like, hey, man, you know, this, this, uh, <laughs> this stock is it, it relatively new. It's a strip club. You can own a strip club. And that was just a unique story. Compliance department shut that down pretty quickly. <laughs> oh man! But but now that you're on your own, now you're free to do all that, right? Yeah, I don't focus on stocks. I mean, stocks are just a byproduct of, uh, you know, the everyday, the, the typical, the investor like you and I, w w which are known as retail. I'm not a professional. I don't, I'm not on the professional side anymore. Uh, retail investors, the most opportunity for them is, you know, using leveraged instruments like options like futures and to really to use a lot less of their capital to make a lot more so the traditional approach to investing is to have 80 to 90 percent in stocks and the rest of it in cash well that doesn't work you know maybe 30 years ago whatever person said that and that was the outcome yeah people still rehash that information because the financial industry is all about taking your money and collecting fees that's it. There's not. There's there's zero edge with the access to technology, with the access to information. All those things that may have made other you know so-called market wizards successful is out the door. I mean, they're they're past. They're gone. The the market's so much more efficient. The so much more effective. Uh, the the edge is gone. You know, for anybody. So the playing field. What I mean by that is as level as possible. And somebody like. Roberts and me and anybody can actually do better than professionals because we don't have those restrictions. It's just about learning your craft or, or you know, actually wanting to do it as well. I mean, it kind of reminds me of like, you know, we keep mentioning all these 80s and 90s movies and stuff. And it, it kind of reminds me of how uh, when people used to go on an airplane, they would call a travel agent, right? Now you just use a computer. So it sounds like that's kind of a similar thing now, right? Like you used to call your stockbroker, but now it makes more sense to learn a little bit and then go online and kind of do do it yourself instead. Yeah, well, I mean, in those days, you didn't have direct access to the marketplace, so you had to go through a broker. And you know, there was a part of it too, you know, like, oh, I got a broker, you're going to, you know, you call them on your phone on the golf club, you know, and feel important. and yes, you feel important. And and at that time, there was different opportunities. Maybe maybe a hedge fund manager did have access to certain information that the street didn't have, but that that doesn't exist anymore. The only way that these hedge fund managers, because they underperform, they underperform, mutual funds underperform, 90% of them underperform every year. So they're collecting fees to give you alpha, but they underperform. And the reason why is because the market's so efficient and there's no edge for them. And they, they 
you're in the hole right when they take their fees. And there's so many other types of hidden fees and everything else. It's just, it's so, it's a money machine. There's a book called, um, it's an old book. It's from like the 1930s, but uh, something about the yachts. I can't think of it anyways. But anyways, brokers, you know, typically the people that have, you know, why do these hedge fund managers have the most money? They're not the smartest people. You know, they don't, they don't even produce that much, uh, that much alpha, alpha meaning return. But they they collect their fees. I mean, this is a, a fees paid out is like a third of our GDP, the financial industry. I mean, it's it's just a, such a a money generating system that's protected by these firms because that's that's their interest is keeping your money in a four hundred one k plan, keeping your money in an IRA, keeping your money away from you as far as you can, so they can collect their little fees. And it might not sound like a lot, but over a time frame for you. And also for them, with millions of people, you know, it becomes it becomes trillions of trillions of dollars every year that they that they look to do that, and they don't have to do anything. I mean, it sounds like kind of like a, a little corrupt system in a way. And so, um, so kind of along. Yeah, this, oh, go ahead. I, I, I don't want to say it's corrupt. I, I, you know, it's it's naiveness. You know, it's it's people who don't want to take control of their money. Uh, they just, you know, it's. There's a little bit. It, it's tough. I mean, it's it's tough because it, they're not doing anything. They're doing what they're saying, you know. And, and, and there's some people that you know actually want to do good. It's just you have restrictions when it comes to the financial markets. You have restrictions on, you know, with firms who don't want you to do this because the risk department. Um, and it's just easier to put people into products, you know. And it it becomes accountability of you and your money and you knowing what to do with it and. Yeah. I mean that's a long discussion on its own. I mean, but it's not it's not as plain cut of like pointing the finger at them. I mean, the easiest way to to stop it is to take your money back. That makes sense. So if people want to, if they want to invest but, in like a strip club or whatever the equivalent is, then <laughs> the research they want to buy some options on in whatever they can they can make their own decisions. They can have their own control. So well, you can have your own control with your money and and how you invest it into the marketplace. And and the first you know first step is like, okay, Josh, I don't want to stop. You know, the fees that you pay over 10, 20, or 10, 15, 20, 25 years, those small, that 2% fee, that compounds. I mean, I could show you a graph of what we have. I mean, we're talking about thousands of dollars. On a $50,000 account, we're talking about thousands of dollars, many of thousands of dollars that you lose that could go into your pocket over that time frame. The first step is just taking your money back. Now, you don't have to go into options. You know, that's, that's, you know, you're 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 wanting to get your blue belt in investing, or you know, taking you know, it, it, this is like a little dojo. Investing is like a dojo. If you want your white belt and to do it yourself, and what I would refer that as is okay. If you want to ha learn just a little bit to be able to defend yourself and protect yourself, you go and you start taking classes. And the first thing you could do taking your money back is you take your money back, and you can put it into. And I, it makes me cringe to say this, <laughs> Robert. It makes me cringe. You could put your money into a Vanguard. Fund, like the the ET or not the ETF, but that's another way to do it. But a Vanguard low cost index fund with the S and P five hundred, and that's that would save you many of thousands of dollars a year just doing that. And you're just going to get the market return, because again, ninety percent of investors or ninety percent of professionals do not beat that index. So if that's the case, why are you trying to bet that ten that you have the ten percent? And you're able to get that 10% that are doing it because you're not going to in and out of different mutual funds. So you just let the market give you what it gives you and just ride that out. Now, if you want to take it to the next step and you want to start managing money more actively, then yeah, then you can start learning how to do that with options and, and things of that sort and being more engaged. But the first step is just to do that. But yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, cool. So, I mean, it sounds like there's, I don't want to keep you too long, but there's a lot of, I mean, really cool, I mean, steps people can take to uh, basically like get the power back, get the control back. Um, don't let the fear and the greed take you over. It, even if they don't know much at all just yet, they can put it into a Vanguard or an ETF, like an index fund or something, and then eventually work their way up to options. So I want to talk a little bit about, you have this, uh, this program called Option Sizzle. So can you tell us what that's about? Yeah, Option Sizzle is my website. That's why I started in the financial crisis. Great time to do that. But uh, that's why I started. And that was the whole medium of being able to teach people how to use options successfully. When I was in the financial 
industry and I was making my cold calls, I would talk about options and I would try to use options and the compliance department would say, nope. And also clients would say, man, options are too fill in the blank. Oh, I don't know much about options. So it started to become a recurring thing that and even my own lack of success with options in the beginning because I lost $2,000, which was my whole account at the time, um, on one one trade, making mistakes people do normally starting out with options. And even though I had this uh, this Series 7 license, which is a industry license, which said I'm a professional and I knew and I could operate in the financial industry, it didn't teach me how to become successful at managing my own money or even using these instruments. So that's where I started to take it to the next level and um, really focus in on it and kind of get to kind of where I'm at now of being in a place to to use them and also you know, help those that are looking to do the same. So this option sizzle, is it a, is it a blog? Is it a membership site? What is this exactly? Well, option, that's the, that's the real estate. That's my domain. That's the area. And when you go there, you'll, you'll be enticed with a bunch of little articles, which are little daily emails that I send out. Um, and you know, the whole, the whole point of that is, is to captivate you to, to get in and start being engaged in, um, we have different products that I offer. I wrote this book called Fearless Investing with Options that it really is the, uh, uh, the book that I wish I had when I first started <laughs> when I first started using options or even studying for my Series 7 because so many options books are just very vanilla and they don't even teach you, you know, kind of a foundation to be successful. They, they give you insight but not anything that is actionable to be able to implement. So, you know, that's kind of the first par- process. And I have other products in there as well uh, that we um, that we offer to, to help, you know, help that. It's almost, I, I have a choose your own adventure kind of approach where, you know, somebody comes in, we we provide something to them. And if they want to continue up with, with working with us and, you know, we start on a low investment opportunity where they, they buy a book or a report, and if they want to continue on with the process, you know, then yeah, you you get more information, which is more value as you kind of continue to go through the journey with us. So they they can try out, and the more they get hooked, the more they can get. Yeah, I mean, it's it. This is this. I I approach this as if you went to a karate class or a martial art class. I mean, like you just don't get your black belt in one day. You know, everyone's ahead of you. You come in on day one, you you have to you you're going to lose. I mean, like you're just there's nothing you can do. You may get lucky, you're not, but you don't know anything, and you have to kind of start at that, and you have to start working your way up. Now, if you want to get that black belt, you know, everyone's different. Maybe someone wants to get a green belt. You know, maybe someone wants to to, to learn this one thing. You know, which I would say that's not how you're going to become successful. But that's not my opportunity to tell them. You know, you know, all you need is to learn that. If you want to learn how to become a black belt, I can certainly help you do that. If you want to learn that, then yeah, you have this. But you know, that's kind of where I let the things kind of fall into place of where they, what they want, and how they, you know, want to approach it. Well, I like that, and I like that. I mean, from what it sounds like, like the like their, their thought process behind, first of all, like your journey from point A to point B, and the way that you've explained, like the way that that you trade and the way that you teach others, it sounds like that. I mean, usually like the two extremes that people go through are either just try to flood you with just all the facts and figures and then that's not helpful at all, right? It sounds like some of the like some of the textbooks that you read. And then the yeah. other the other extreme is someone saying, well, you have to do it exactly this way. And I think what, what's kind of cool about the way you've explained all this is, you know, maybe there's like four or five different paths, right? Maybe there's a, a couple of different places someone wants to end up and you kind of give them the strategy to kind of put different things together and, and get to that specific place they want to get to. Yeah, some people just want trade ideas and it drives me up the wall because, you know, they just like because it's not just about the trade ideas, it's about the logic, but you know, for so long, you know, I know that you focus in on membership stuff and I actually deviated from that. I was I had a membership, I had a recurring, and I deviated from it because I'm like, well, I want to teach people how to become masters. But not everyone wants to become a master. Some and people just dabble, right? And some people just dabble and you know, it really took me to this experience where I was at this, uh, uh, this, this um, store, the grocery store, 
and they actually have a very nice wine collection and they have really solid wine people there that really know well supposedly they know they could, they could tell a hell of a story <laughs> they sound convincing oh well it's just not like any kind of wine place they're like oh you know is this good they'll tell you like i bought this hundred dollar bottle of wine it was the most expensive bottle i've ever bought i bought it because he told me about giuseppe and his last harvest and he told me the story <laughs> and i'm like I'm like, okay, I can't, you know, Giuseppe passed away on his last harvest and this is his bot. I'm like, I'm done. It was like he died as he was putting the cork in the last one. Almost. I'm like, man, I can just visualize, you know, Giuseppe on his rocking chair overlooking the harvest. This is his last harvest. I have the bottle and he's passed away. And like, how else would you want to go? I'm doing this for Giuseppe. Done. Let's, <laughs> let's do this. And then I get home and I have buyer's remorse. I'm like, oh, but it was one of the best bottles of wine I've ever had. Anyways, um, but the guys there, they can tell you a good story. They can tell you about the regions and everything else. But it really took me this one time. I went in, and my girlfriend, Nicole, she's not crazy about the stories. But she went in. She was like, listen, we just got to go in. We just, I just want to get wine. I don't want to hear stories. I just want to get a bottle of wine. Let's go. So I went in my own one time, and I was kind of feeling the same way. So the guy that we knew, he was like, hey, how's it going? I'm like, oh, I'm doing good. And I asked him, like, hey, I just need a bottle of wine under 15 bucks. He starts talking about all this. And, and it really took me to that point because I'm like, man, I just want the bottle of wine. Like I don't need to know everything about the bottle of wine. And then it was that kind of my aha moment of like, maybe that's how other people feel. Like maybe they just don't want to know everything that I know about options. You know, the in-depth analysis and the the time involved. Maybe they just want to see, hey, does this guy, you know, if he has a couple good picks, maybe, you know, maybe <laughs> I'll just follow him. And 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 I almost, you know, now I kind of look at it as like giving them uh broccoli that's wrapped in bacon almost you know i can still teach them how to trade options successfully with giving them picks so this is a little bit of a longer rant but yeah that's that's how people are you know you, i'm still learning you know i still every day i'm learning i might be further ahead doesn't make me better than anybody else i know and have experience which you know is is what it is but every day i'm still you know trying to get better every day i'm still getting after it learning all the, all those things, and you know, just because you get to a black belt in a, a martial art doesn't mean your learning stops either. You continue to, you know, try to keep learning, and that's kind of the same way with investing and, and really just business and anything. You know, life it's just getting better every day. I mean, yeah, you, you take too long of a break, get too comfortable, you backslide. That's where you start to cut corners. Yeah, that's where you lose your discipline scary place to be so I mean as you're winding down this call could you tell us like what's like the the big number one mistake you see people anywhere making their mistakes with their money or with trading or with with anything in that category well I think it's just proper expectations you know when it comes to business and and you know just thinking about business and and different things as well it's just the expectations are are not there um, and what I mean specifically is like if you bought like we're I, I made the little joke about buying Amazon when it was you know, well, I don't know if I made the joke earlier. Um, you know, some people would think like, oh man, if I just would have bought Amazon's IPO when it came out in um, in May, I think it was 1995, and would have held it to this day, $5,000 would be worth over a million dollars. I mean, that's one stock out of how many that's out there. It doesn't work that way. And there's no way that you would be able to hold that investment for that long. I mean, like that this, that doesn't work. You know, like you fear the, and greed. The, the money would have burned a hole in your pocket. The 2008 crash would have done whatever all that stuff right it's not smart as is I mean it's not smart you got to take your wins when you can that's where people don't you know like when you people talk about managing risk but they don't talk about the other side of managing risk which is taking your wins and taking that risk off the table and what I mean specifically like I had just I had this business that I just sold it started it three years ago it made some passive income it was Amazon based this is just a different type of investment I threw some money at it made some money and for me I don't you know, I made money on it. I wanted to lock it up. Could it keep going? Sure. But I rather take my money and find something else to put it in and keep going. I don't care if I had the opportunity to buy Amazon stock. I would have never held it. And that's not how that's not how you can approach things in life because that's a, that's an outlier. That's a rare event that doesn't happen. You and you can't approach it. So it's really just about expectations and managing risk and taking, you know, when you manage risk, it's not about the loss side, it's about the win side. It's about taking that win, and yeah, you hear about people who turn down the, you know, Google's offer and look at them now. 
yeah, look at them, but there's not anyone else behind them because there's only one. You only hear about them because of what about the other hundred or thousand people? You know, it, you can't, you, they were lucky. They took the risk. That's big risk. You know, good for them. But, you know, when you're starting out, you don't have, your cushion for risk is very limited. Now, when you get bigger, yeah, you know, you could take on bigger risks and so forth, but it's just being able to quantify that risk and, you know, kind of understanding it. You know, with people in the marketplace, they put too much money at risk. They don't, you know, it's it's what we're talking about earlier with the, the traditional approach of 80%, you know, in invested. Well, when the market goes down, which it does and will, those positions, they sell them at the worst case because they get margin called. With with what we can do now with being able to teach somebody like you or anybody is that you can use 30% of your capital and still make those same returns and have 70% in your 70% in cash. Why do you have cash? Well, because that's your lifeline. That's the only thing that you have. So what you're not essentially making money on it and you could make money, but you can't do that. You have to keep that in a safe place. You have to keep it, you know, because when even if you're using 30%, when the markets when things happen, positions go against you, you have to be able to have that money to be able to kind of buy yourself duration, buy yourself some time. And when things are great, things are great. When things are bad, you have to be able to have something in the reserve tank to be able to to buffer that, just to be able to buy yourself some duration. So the same thing in business, I think it's the same thing in investing as well. Or, you know, and, and, and a lot of people say trading. I say active, you know, active. And I don't do day trading. I don't think, you know, there's people who do day trading. That's fine for them. I've never been successful at it. I know very peop very few people who have been successful. My approach isn't about day trading. My approach is about just being more active with your money and more engaged. You don't have to be change your computer every day and be Johnny and Mr. Market. You can be successful, make I, I above average returns than the market market provides, and you don't have to be chained to your computer. And and that's the dream because I know that that was a, re a real problem with me, and I think that it kind of comes full full circle. Like at the beginning, you said it comes back to fear and greed, and I think that I used to oh, I I couldn't help but like check that stuff, check that portfolio, check the numbers every couple of minutes, and it was just it just emotionally messed me up. And especially like if it dropped a tiny bit, I'd be like, oh my gosh, I got a panic sell. And if it jumped a bunch, I like, I got to buy some more. And then if I sold it and it kept going up, I just, it, I just, it was such a roller coaster. So it sounds like, um, you too have, many variables. That's yeah. why. So, and, and it was and just it, all unchecked too. The way that, the way that I try to do that now, and we can do that with options is make it, you know, and really kind of work in your, I, I read some uh, information about yourself and how you like to create systems. That's the way that I, now approach teaching people to take those variables out of it to, to manage risk before entry because so you're stopping out you didn't have an idea area of where things could go proper expectations so you're panicking and you're selling at really the wrong time and then also when it goes against you you're like oh man where do i sell it do i sell here do i sell there well to create consistency you have to have consistency in a consistent plan and be able to execute that so that's where a lot of people fail in investing because it's all variable Meaning that, well, it's kind of like calling audibles. Well, maybe I'll do it here. Maybe I'll do it there. Maybe I'll sell high. You, you, everything, the market is random. So to get consistent results, you have to have a consistent approach and be able to execute on that. And that's kind of where, you know, I have started to kind of really kind of form into the fact of I'm going to help you become a machine. And I'm going to teach you exactly the things to, to be mechanical, to be systemized on where you can use options to reduce your risk, create better returns, and and have a, an approach that's you know is going to help you take away that fear and greed. And really, the fear and greed is because you don't know what to do. I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense, especially like like planning. I mean, planning your exit ahead of time sound, just sounds awesome. Because, and also that like, the marketplace is random, and if you're also random, it's just a big mess. But at least if the marketplace itself is random, and you have, are somewhat structured and ordered and systematized and at least you can kind of make sense and you can kind of get what you want out of it it sounds like absolutely and it's and it's also eliminating opinions because you know no one knows you know there's no there's no such thing as a good stock picker there's no such thing there's the the probability of being right is 50% when you pick stocks with options we can skew that probability of success 
even greater. There's a trade-off, which everything in life has a trade-off. You don't make as much money, but there's no such thing as unlimited profit potential. It's like a drug. It's like the crack of Wall Street. You know, like going back to the Amazon thing, like, oh, I would have, no, there's no such thing as that. There's no, if you think, if you're so scared that the market's going to go to zero or that this stock is going to go to zero, go bankrupt, then you can't have the other spectrum and think the same thing. Well, it's it could do that, but I'm only going to do and, and, you know, buy stocks or options because I think it's going to go, Apple's going to go to 200. There's actually expectations that we can look at option pricing right now that gives us an expectation of what the market's priced in. We're talking about billions of dollars that say that's not going to happen or what the probability of that's going to happen. And we can quantify that. And that's how we eliminate that opinion, how we eliminate the, the fear and the greed because we can provide the expectations, the predetermined outcomes you know, of, okay, I knew that this had a 75% chance of winning. However, there was a 25% chance that didn't, it wasn't going to win. But because I knew that that 25% chance was there, I already accounted for that loss because I knew that could happen. It happened here, but I know that, that was, I got that out of the way and I'm going to keep going. Continue to be consistent because the odds, the numbers aren't, it's the same way that how Vegas works. It's the same exact way. I mean, I mean, better than going in 50-50, right? At least you kind of somewhat hedge your bets. Well, there's nothing. So, you know, 50-50 bets are fine, but you have to have a consistent, uh, you have to be consistent on when you take profits and manage risk as well because you start to vary, you start to get variable data. data and, and, that ver and, and that kind of skew will really hurt you on doing that. So a lot of people, they take a big loss and they go, because they didn't size correctly the position and they have a big loss and it goes, oh man, I'm going to take a break. No, you got to keep going. You can't just take a break when, I mean, like you got to keep going because now you, you dramatically skew the, the numbers against you. You know, the, we, for some reason in, in, when it comes to investing, we approach it like, oh my God, like we don't know what to do. But everything else in life, we have so much of it. Uh, we have we we take so much data and we go buy it. Uh, but when the marketplace, it's like, nope, you know, so and so knows more than I do. No, they don't. They don't know more than you do because it's random. I mean, that makes sense to me. So, I mean, I really like um, everything you share with us today. I really like your message. So, could you state for us one more time uh, your website and and your books and anything that you want people to check out? Yeah, I don't. I mean, I don't have a strong call to action to several websites. You can only go to optionsizzle.com, and that's where you'll be able to find that uh, find more information about me. And if you're interested in, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll if you just want to take your money back, and we have a report on how you can do that, take your money back and and have control over it. Or if you want to take the next step and you want to learn more about how you can make more money after you have that control cuz i mean it's it's a big step i mean a lot of people are very reluctant you know cuz right. cuz they don't have the confidence of being able to do it themselves there's still this fact of like man well what happens if i do worse that's the that's the problem people are so scared that they're going to do worse they they go Josh i hear you i know that i'm going to lose money or i'm getting ripped off but i rather get ripped off this much than lose more than am i doing it myself well we could show you how to do that in a very simple process and i know it's a it's a it's a shrug of a shoulder, but that's how people really feel. There's a lot on the line. There's a lot of pressure on them, um, but we can go from there. And you can visit optionsizzle.com, and you can see the the book that I wrote, which can be a great introduction to learning how to be successful with options. And even for those who, you know, quote unquote, no options, this is a good reeducation of maybe some techniques that and a process that you didn't really know. That maybe they skipped over or something. Yeah, correct. Cool. So option sizzle, everything is there. That's where the, the magic begins, where dreams happen. So Josh, <laughs> so thanks for being on the show. I appreciated all the, the witty banter and all the cool tangents we went on. We covered a lot of cool stuff. Uh, I'm really glad you're here. So optionsizzle.com is the place to go.